All right, let's try this. Uh, so, mastery test number seven. Number one, hardly anybody missed this one. I'm guessing that if you did, it's because you read too quickly, and so it wants to know under what conditions do real gases behave most like ideal gases. In the past, that question's been asked often as when do gases deviate most from the ideal gas law? So read more slowly and carefully. Number two, a fair amount of people missed. The volume of a sample of gas has a pressure of P1. If the volume of the sample of gas is doubled, how must the temperature of the gas change in order to maintain a constant pressure of P1? So by doubling the volume, that would reduce the pressure. So in order to maintain a constant pressure, those molecules are going to have to have more energy and they're going to have to move faster and collide with the walls more often. So if you are doubling the volume, you are going to have to also double the temperature to keep the pressure constant. Number three. One mole of argon gas is obtained at one atmosphere and occupies 20 liters. If the volume is reduced to 10 liters, so reducing the volume to 10 liters would increase your pressure proportionally. So, and then it says the volume is reduced to 10 liters and the pressure is increased to three atmospheres. How does the average kinetic energy of the argon atoms change? Well, if so that volume change from 20 to 10 liters should increase your pressure at a constant temperature to only two atmospheres because pressure and volume are inversely proportional. So where did that extra pressure come from? It came from the fact that the molecules would have to be moving faster and if they are moving faster then that would mean an average or an increase in the average kinetic energy. So that's a, you know, a tricky question, but the change in volume isn't sufficient to change pressure as much as it did. So there would also have to be a subsequent increase in temperature, which would mean an increase in average kinetic energy. Number four. Number four, a very commonly missed question. One mole of each noble gas is held in a flask at room temperature. If the flasks are cooled, which gas would you expect to condense to a liquid first? So what it's asking is, which of the noble gases would have the highest boiling point? Because as the temperatures are lowered, the first one to condense to become a liquid would be the one with the highest boiling point. The last one to condense would be the one with the lowest boiling point. And so then you would choose accordingly uh, using what you know about intermolecular forces and the mass of the molecules, or particles in this case. Number five, number five, also very commonly missed question. Which of the following best describes the relationship between vapor pressure and boiling point? So, uh, boy, I feel like I've said this a whole lot of times, but maybe this time I'll be heard. Boiling point is the temperature at which vapor pressure equals atmospheric pressure. And vapor pressure is due to molecules escaping through the surface of a sample of liquid. So if vapor pressure is very high, there's already a high deal of escaping, the temperature that you would have to raise it to for that pressure to equal atmospheric pressure would be quite low. Subsequently, if the vapor pressure is very, very low, so there's very little escaping at the surface of the liquid, then you would have to energize those particles a great deal. You would have to raise the temperature very much to get them to escape at such a rate that it would equal atmospheric pressure. So vapor pressure and boiling point are inversely proportional, and you would need to select an answer that reflects that. Uh, number six. So we have to keep in mind the volume here actually doesn't matter. What matters is that when potassium phosphate, K3PO4, dissolves in water, it's going to dissociate into three potassium ions and one phosphate ion. So the concentration of potassium will be three times that of the potassium phosphate. 
number seven, which the following compound, uh, pretty much nobody missed seven. So, but it would be the, you know, you'd select the ionic compound that is made out of the most ions. And so, you know, count up the ions. Keep in mind that covalent compounds do not dissociate in water and polyatomic ions do not dissociate in water. Uh, number eight, we did well on, so the one that's not going to behave as an electrolyte is the one that is the covalent compound. Number nine, we did great on. Number ten, but, okay, so on number nine, if you happen to miss it, sodium chloride is going to dissociate into ions. So sodium and chloride, so that's two ions. So if one mole of sodium chloride dissolved, you would get two moles of ions. If three moles of sodium chloride would dissolve, you would get six moles of ions. Number 10. Uh, which of those would not dissolve in water? So a lot of folks chose the covalent compound. Well, covalent compounds will dissolve in water, but they will not dissociate when they dissolve. But things like sugar or ethanol, they dissolve in water, but some things do not dissolve at all, and so you would need to select the thing that is not polar and that will not, not dissolve in water. Uh, number 11, so delta H, delta H is a measurement of the change in enthalpy, and so if the change in enthalpy is positive. That means that heat, the heat content of the system increased, so it would be an endothermic reaction. If delta H is negative, that means that the heat content of the system decreased, which means that it was an exothermic reaction. And uh, an endothermic reaction, so it's pulling heat inward, it would make the surroundings cooler. An exothermic reaction, it is going to release heat outward, and it would make the surroundings warmer. Number 12, surprisingly, number 12, we did quite well on. Uh, number 12, we want to figure out, you know, why different things would, why different substances would have different temperature change changes, even though they absorb the same amount of energy. And it says in the question that they all have the same mass, which was a commonly uh, chosen answer that, you know, the map, but it says in the question that the mass would be the same. So, yeah, the difference between different substances are that they have different specific heats. And so if you have a low specific heat, that means it takes very little energy to raise one gram by one degree. If you have a high specific heat, it means that you have a, it requires a lot of energy to raise one gram by one degree Celsius. So the one that would undergo the greatest temperature change would be the one that would have the lowest specific heat. Uh, number 13, this is some stoichiometry with a thermochemical equation. So you would need to relate the moles of methane to the negative 810 kilojoules per mole and then convert those moles to grams. So but we... No, a lot of us missed number 13. Hmm. All right. Number 14. So this is basic recognition that delta G, delta G tells us whether or not a reaction is going to be spontaneous or non-spontaneous. And so a positive delta G means that the reaction will be non-spontaneous, and a negative delta G means that the reaction would be spontaneous. Number 15. Boy, oh boy, we missed 15 in abundance. So the relationship between reaction rate and reaction spontaneity, it sounds a lot like, based on popular vernacular, that those two things should be related, but that scientifically they are not. A spontaneous reaction can proceed very slowly. A non-spontaneous reaction could also, you know, depending on what the setup is to drive that non-spontaneous reaction, could occur very quickly. So spontaneity and reaction rate are not related.
number 16 uh, with the general formula for an alkyne. So with an alkyne, you're going to have a triple bond, and you are going to have two fewer hydrogens than you would in an alkene. So it's CnH 2n minus 2. Uh, number 17. Number 17 you really need to see a picture for, but let's see. Ooh, some folks said that these two organic molecules here are isotopes of one another. I guess that was just a little bit of term confusion. So uh, they would be made out of all the same particles, but in a different arrangement. So that is what we would call structural isomers of one another. And let's see, number 18 talks about the relationship between KEQ and Q. And so if Q, the reaction quotient, would be higher than KEQ, that means there is an overabundance of products and an underabundance of reactants. So the reaction would need to shift towards the reactants, which would mean the products would decrease and the reactants would increase. If KEQ is greater than the reaction quotient, so Q is too small, then that means that the products are too few and the reactants are overabundant. And so the reaction will shift towards the products, using up some of the reactants and producing more of the products, increasing their concentration. So basically you set up an equilibrium expression, you think about what the fraction means, and then which side of the fraction products or reactants needs to get larger. Number 19, uh, let's see. So in number 19, despite the fact that it says at the end of the question, pay attention to state symbols, just a whole bunch of folks shows the equilibrium expression that included iron and iron oxide or iron 3 oxide in the expression. Well, since iron and iron 3 oxide are labeled as solids, solids do not get to be incorporated into equilibrium expressions, nor do liquids. So you need to take that into account that only gaseous and aqueous species are included in equilibrium expressions. And lastly, number 20. Uh, we did quite well on this. So Judging by that graph, the activation energy of the reverse reaction is going to be very much greater than the activation energy of the forward reaction. So keep in mind that activation energy is the height from initial energy to the apex, to the peak, where the activated complex would be. All right, so that's the end of the multiple choice. And then... I don't know. Let's go through the naming, I guess. So on the naming, you got PB, which PB is lead, and lead is a transition metal as a variable charge. So then, oh, that's embarrassing. It's so uh, it has hydroxide bonded to it. Hydroxide is a minus one charge. So that means the lead it would be lead 3 hydroxide, which is sort of nonsense because that doesn't really exist, but, you know, still the naming convention would hold. Uh, the next one is Hg2CO3, well, Hg is mercury, CO3 is carbonate, but mercury has a variable charge, so we would need to specify, so since carbonate has a 2 minus charge, then mercury, since there are two of them, would have a one charge, so it would be mercury one carbonate. 23, sodium bicarbonate. So sodium's in A, it's a plus one charge. Bicarbonate, it's HCO3, it's a minus one charge. So it'd be NaHCO3. Chloric acid, so it doesn't say hydro, so that means that this must be a polyatomic ion as an acid. So uh, chloric would come from chlorate, so it would be HClO3. Uh, 25 is C3H8, and three carbons, so that means it would be, well, it's made out of just carbons and hydrogens, 
So that tells me it's a hydrocarbon. There are, so it's C3H8, so there are twice as many hydrogens with two extra, so that means it's an alkane. And there are three carbons, so that means prop, so 25 would be called propane. And then from there, you kind of got to see these guys. So, all right. Hopefully that helps. If you use it, if you listen, whatever.